Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lisa Stromquist and I'm the coordinator for quality and patient safety uh, at the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. And uh, before we get started with today's presentations and announcements, I just uh, like to remind everybody online that all the lines are coming in muted. Uh, that will allow uh, us to record the presentation without any background noise and there won't be any distractions for the presenters. Um, uh, again, so it is being uh, recorded and you will be able to view this at a later date on CAFC's Knowledge Exchange Network. So right now I'm going to hand uh, the mic over to Elaine Orbein, CAFC's President and CEO. Thanks, Lisa. Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to those of those colleagues on the East Coast. It's my pleasure to really join everyone on our new season's patient safety collaborative uh, webinars and, and uh, teleconferences together, and uh, welcome everybody back to a brand new season. Um, I wanted and asked for just a few moments at the top of today's webinars to just um, remind everyone and extend a very warm welcome to you to CAFC's 2013 annual conference. I think many of you online uh, with us this morning are, are planning to join us and I just wanted to let you know that of course we are just a few short weeks away. This year's conference is going to be held in Toronto at the Intercontinental inter, uh, uh, Toronto Centre Hotel as well as the Metro Toronto Convention Center. Um, our theme this year is, is very appropriate to a lot of our patient safety work together, and it's in innovations in children's health care from inspiration to application. Lots of information is on the CAFC conference site, um, and just a, just a click away for you, just go to the CAFC website and, and click on the conference information. Um, our final program is posted on the website and uh, lots of information there for you to access. Um, if you have any questions at all or are having any difficulty registering or just learning more about um, the event itself, please don't hesitate to contact me directly and or Lisa or any one of us in the CAFC office. Um, we have, as per tradition, a very important and innovative patient safety symposium being planned uh, as part of our conference. And it's my pleasure to turn over to uh, Tracy Wrong um, to uh, give us an overview of uh, what's being planned uh, for patient safety at this year's conference. Tracy, over to you. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, welcome, everybody, to today's uh, Patient Safety Collaborative uh, teleconference. Uh, to pick up on what Elaine was talking about, I absolutely would like to remind you about the uh, CAFC Patient Safety Symposium, which will be held Sunday, October 20th as part of the CAFC conference. Um, it, the title of the symposium is called From Innovation to Activation, The Increasing Role of Families in Rapid Response Teams. And um, it, it's going to shape up to be a really, really interesting and informative um, presentation and discussion opportunity. So I, I really encourage you all to attend. I also wanted to flag for your attention the fact that um, throughout the conference we're going to have what is special and new this year. It's called a patient safety resource table. And this will allow us uh, um, participants from across the country to bring uh, resources that they'd like to share with other um, uh, organizations so that they can copy and steal shamelessly, um, but also all in the spirit of uh, increasing patient safety. And so if you are interested in uh, demonstrating or providing any materials to the resource table uh, from your organization, please contact Lisa Stromquist uh, by email or give her a shout at the CAFC office and she could tell you the details about how to participate in that. Really it's all about um, you know, having a little takeaway or something of interest that we can uh, share with our col colleagues um, and possibly bring back to your organization. So um, we look forward to seeing what um, what is uh, being developed out in the community. So um, hope to see you at the com at the symposium, and we'll perhaps move right ahead into today's webinar topic. Uh, the topic uh, today is called the Safety Challenge: Approving Adolescent Medication Adherence. And our speaker is Dr. Natalie Deneka. De oh, I'm going to get this right. I was so sure I was going to get it right. Natalie Deneka, uh, who is a pharmacist at CHEO. 
So Natalie has for, focused her career on pediatric pharmacy while specializing in the outpatient area of HIV and recently adding the inpatient areas of cardiology, uh, surgery, and acute pain. Natalie has served as a pharmacist way up north in Churchill, Manitoba, down south in Philadelphia, and at the Hospital Sick Children in Toronto. Uh, she has collaborated on pediatric national and international publications and is a past recipient of the Pharmacy Practice Commitment to Care Award for Hospital Pharmacy. She's also a fellow of the Canadian Society of Pedi uh, Hospital Pharmacy. For over 15 years, Natalie has counseled many patients and their parents as a member of CHEO's award-winning HIV team. Natalie says she feels very fortunate to have the opportunity to now work with the surgical patients and their families, plus liaison with the acute pain service. So I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Natalie Deneco right now, and um, we'll look forward to hearing a, a very thought-provoking and interesting uh, presentation. So over to you, Natalie. Well, thank you very much, Tracy. And uh, throughout the talk, I guess it's only Lisa that's going to be able to respond. I want to make sure that uh, you can hear me. I um, am speaking into a phone as opposed to a microphone, and I do have a concern that I will be loud enough. So please let me know if um, send me a, a message on the chat if I am not loud enough. So as some of you might recognize, this is a very important topic to me. I've lectured locally and nationally. I've published on this talk, topic, but I just can't shake it off. And unfortunately, it continues to plague me in my clinic. We're talking about safety of medications. We have safe drugs. We have safe pediatric doses. We have safe delivery systems with safe administration. We talk about the right drug, the right patient, the right dose, but what is the impact of all those efforts if the patient doesn't take their medication? So how are you and I going to ensure that our patients keep taking their medication? So my goal today is to raise the concern about um, medication adherence. Let's explore some of the barriers to it that impede adherence. Let's share some possible strategies, and let's debate some of the advantages and disadvantages of those strategies. There are many definitions of adherence, but this is the definition that I like. It's the extent to which a patient's health-related behaviors correspond with the medical advice that they are given. Now, this is a real easy topic. Just think of it as a formula that an adolescent would recognize from their high school math. And of course, I'm being a bit sarcastic here. So to understand the problem, let's estimate the pediatric patient's adherence percent with oral antihyperglycemic medications. Lisa? The results, 26% um, uh, guess that 30% uh, of patients are adherent, 53% uh, said 45% uh, adherence, 21% said 75, I have another and one. zero at 90. Okay. Well, great, you're right. The, um, there was a large um, American uh, study that looked at pediatric, a uh, large pediatric database, and they estimated that the adherence for diabetic patients was about 45%. So let's compare this to other published studies. For sexually assaulted uh, victims on their uh, HIV post-exposure <laughs> prophylaxis, the published percent is 15, 15%. CHEO make sure that they call all of these uh, patients, and as well as we'll see them as often as we need to in clinic during their 28 days of therapy, and we can uh, bump that uh, adherence rate up to 55%. With asthma, 46 to 58% are adherent. HIV, it's estimated 69% adherence, and transplant patients, 69%. 
And I find it interesting with transplant patients, only 69% um, because they're risking losing that uh, transplanted organ. So if we look at adolescent transplant recipients, notice that the one-year graph and patient survival for adolescents is greater than children. But that's the opposite when we look at their long-term outcome. Do children do better? This finding is repeated again in the, da um, the uh, study that I mentioned about the diabetic patients. As well, the less than 12 years of age patients have a higher adherence. So what's going on? Well, this, this might be a clue. Poll number two. And Lisa, let's spend less time on this. Um, <laughs> when do you think a teenager becomes responsible for remembering to take their own medication? 43% said 15 to 16 years old. 24% um, said 17 to 18. 19% said 13 to 14. 14% said 11 to 12 years old. Okay, so unfortunately you're not right for this one as well. It's from According to this, uh, the published data that I'm showing here, this is a published data looking at pediatric and adolescent liver transplant recipients. And they looked at when are the patients responsible for looking after their medication. Under nine years of age was clear. It's the caregiver. Over 17, again clear, it's the adolescent. But look at this, 11 to 12 year olds, there's a 50-50 split of taking responsibility of taking their medication. So, who's driving the bus here? It's that young child. So what do they think about their medication? And this is a quote from a study looking at youth perception of taking chronic medications. And it's supposed to make you better, but it really doesn't. Hmm. So when we look at the youth perception of health, that is more influential than the estimated uh, or established biological markers. Sure, I can quote the glycosylated hemoglobin, which should be less than 7%, or the CD4 count should be greater than 200, or the INR should be greater than, or there should be 2.5. But for the adolescent, they have to believe that taking the medication is better for them, not uh, statistics or markers that I'm going to quote. And they'll stop taking their medications if they don't like the adverse drug reaction. The use perception of treatment has been divided into four main themes, knowledge, decision-making, difficulties taking medication, and adherence. So for all the teaching that we do in our clinics, our patients will still report they're confused about the purpose. They are confused about the value. Why are they taking medications that don't cure them? And what about these alternatives? homeopathic and herbal medications, they advertise that they cure. And they misunderstood. They think they hear contradictory information coming from us. And what about these analogies that we use? We need to ensure that the patients understand the difference between the fact and the analogy used. And if we're using an, an analogy, no matter how clear it seems to us, we have to ensure that our teens know it's just an analogy. So, I mean, I always talk about soldiers in the blood, and I have to really make sure that I'm not that they know I'm not really talking about soldiers in the blood. So, what about decision making? Well, the teens report that um, the doctors are making the choice. They're not being told about the medications. They don't understand what they're being told, and they're not being told the name of the medications. And, you know, I can really relate to this in my clinic. I um, spend a lot of time teaching the adolescents. We have a clinic nurse. We have physicians. We have a full team that is educating um, our teens. And we have a teen group as well. But they still go to the adult hospital once they reach 18, and they don't know their medications. So I think uh, this is actually another great topic for a teleconference in the future, the transition of teenagers to adult care. So when do, um, what do teens state would help? Well, they want to 
participate in the choice of uh, how to take their medications and which um, and they want to pick the different medications to avoid adverse effects. They say that they're overwhelmed by the decision the diagnosis. They're too young to be taking medications. That medication administration may lead to unintentional disclosures. They uh, don't trust or they dislike the healthcare team that they're working with. And um, they, they feel that maybe we as a uh, healthcare team are unwilling to discuss treatment options with them. What the team says that they want is they want a trusted adult to help facilitate the decision of medications. It could be the physician or a parent or a friend or a counselor. And they have difficulties taking their medication. They, they think it's, it's disruptive to their social routine. The medication administration during school needs to be avoided. Um, what about weekend issues, sleepovers? You know, they, they don't take their medications to the sleepovers. They um, want to sleep in on weekends till noon and what happens to their morning dose time? They're rushed to get to school in the morning. Maybe they don't have time to take their medications. And if they go on vacation with uh, youth groups or with extended families, who may not know their diagnosis, and that's especially with, example, HIV. They feel their medications are a hassle. It's a daily reminder of their diagnosis or their disease, and they're concerned about the side effects, and will they at all have any negative effects on their body image. With adherence, they're inconsistent. They take medication when they feel like it. And they feel they need some breaks from this medication. They need medication holidays. They sometimes take them depending on how they feel, and they, they don't keep track of them because they're, they're just medication. Now, the teams who report in these studies that they're adherent say, you know, it's, it's easy to take them if you just force yourself. So what's the take-home message, um, message from the literature about what, teens feel about adherence? Well, they, they want to be empowered. They want autonomy. They want to make some of the decisions. They want us to give some clear analogies, and we need to assess if they're, they're getting it. Do they understand us? They want to be involved in every step of the decision-making. They want to be part of just even when to initiate therapy, what medications to select, and when to take them. Our counseling needs to reflect those desires, why they're taking their medication, why they take medication that doesn't cure them, and why they have to take more than one medication. We need to review the different names of the medications with them, and if they want to use generics or trade names or a combination, whatever they choose. The youth needs to be involved in some aspect or any aspect of, of the treatment decision we can. So we need to support them to manage the decisions they make, and we need to address the difficulties that they have of medication ad administration and the difficulties of their own unique situations. So one of the things that I use in my clinic is um, medication cards. These are plasticized, and we, whenever we're talking about these medications, these names are on the counseling table in front of me for the patient. They will pick whether they want to use the generic or the trade, and it can vary between their medications, what names they pick, and I record that, and that's the name I use when I'm talking about their medication. I also have actual samples of the pills, so we can see what size they are. We can um, also um, talk about them directly. Instead of thinking the, the pink colored one or the rose colored one, it's in front of us to talk about um, that medication. So smoking sensation and, and adherence. This is an interesting dilemma. Female adolescents, the only age group that are increasing in number of smokers. So what are we doing? So what, how have we addressed smoking sensation? We have, um, uh, in on, uh, Ottawa, our uh, adolescents have access to free nicotine patches.
but our youths have been turned down when they do not go to counseling. There's this um, neat um, program called Kick Butt for Two. It's an eight-week program for pregnant teens and young single parents. And they know what this group know, uh, needs. They give them free child care and bus tickets to attract them. So what are some predictors of good compliance? This is a... Um, questionnaire that was sent to over a thousand youths with different chronic illnesses such as asthma, epilepsy, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. The adolescents reported that good um, uh, adherence was possible when they had support and that support was from the health practitioners, from the nurse or the pharmacist, the support could be from parents or friends or peers. Buddy systems have been reported in the literature. And an adherent adolescent had the energy and willpower to be ad adherent. They wanted their parents involved. They wanted the parents to accept the way they care for themselves, to support them, to generally, generally be interested in them, to remind them, and to motivate them to take care of themselves. Motivating is the essence of a whole style of medication counseling. Adolescents can be well informed, well motivated, but if they lack sufficient behavior skills, they will be unable to adhere to the regime. So we as healthcare workers have to become coaches. Just like a coach might teach a, an adolescent to shoot a puck or to pass the, uh, the ring and ringette, we need to become a coach to facilitate teenagers developing behavior skills required for medication adherence. The patient must decide it's time to change, and behavior modification has to be based on the child or the, or the teen's priorities, not the healthcare workers nor their parents. So we need to look at this from the adolescent perspective. Is it important to the adolescent to change? Or is the adolescent confident they can change? Are they ready for change now? And what does the adolescent think the barriers to change are? What does the adolescent lose by changing? And what does the adolescent feel they will gain by not changing? Again, I, I think motivational interviewing is another great future topic for a teleconference. So how do we estimate adherence? Well, this is a study of pediatric and adolescent liver transplant patients, and they compared five different methods, asking the parent, the uh, patient, the attending physician, the nurse, or looking at medication blood levels. And the most objective measure was the best estimate. So let's look at some other objective measures of adherence. We can have direct measures where we look at blood levels. And these blood levels can be of surrogate markers, biological markers, such as glycosylated hemoglobin or the INR. It can be of drug levels, as long as the drug levels reflect um, the doses given and there's something with drug levels called appointment loading and that's when you take your medications a few days before your appointment so you have a measurable uh, level when the doctor goes to measure it so and this is well described in the anti-epileptic um, areas so there's some indirect measures such as um, pill counts or refill history from the community pharmacies. There's also electronic monitoring devices from MEMS or um, MEMBLOG inhalers. So these, um, what uh, MEMS are, the Medication Electronic Monitoring System, this is a lid that attaches to the prescription vial and every time it's opened, it registers as a number. And this can go on uh, 
for uh, months. The battery will live for months, and or um, it can be a short term. And the information can be loaded from home using a home link to the research center or to the clinic. I mentioned the MemLog. This is a device that fits on an inhaler, and it records the date and time a medication was used, and it also has some bonus uh, attributes. It can evaluate the patient's technique, and it even, even has an audible alarm to let the patient uh, remind the patient a dose is due. And this comes with a docking station, so the patient can send their information back to the uh, data center, the clinic, or the research center. So what do these measures of adherence show? In 2011, there was a, a systematic review of these various interventions. And this review found that the successful features for an intervention is when the intervention targets a narrow age range, they include the family, and they improve access to care. So if we are tar talking about targeting a group, we need to know the barriers for that group. So research into barriers for patients with asthma and cystic fibrosis was conducted. And they did a questionnaire of barriers. To contrast adherence, they also measured the uh, self-reported of adherence, daily phone diaries, prescription refill data, and they used electronic monitoring devices. And they found that the barriers were patients just simply forget opposition, uh, oppositional behavior. This is when you say, I'm going to be adherent, but you go to a sleepover and you don't take your medication. Time management issues, not having enough time in the morning when you get up and have to rush for that bus. The side effects, difficulty swallowing pills, and the taste of medications. One criticism I had of this study was they lumped the parents and the teachers, teens' responses together. And a study improvement for me would have been to have these reported separately. There were communication barriers reported. There was a discrepancy between what the physicians prescribed and what the parents and the patient understood. There was confusion between what past medications the patient was taking and their current medications. New treatments were well understood and parents modified long-term prescriptions to, to state what they thought should be stated. So I think this is really a great opportunity for medication reconciliation and again another topic for a future teleconference. So how do adolescents compare with their adherence rates to other groups? In a published study looking at pediatric HIV medications, adherence really wasn't that stellar. 30% missed at least one dose in the last three days, 42% missed one dose in the preceding seven days, and 58% missed um, reported re refill rates of only 75%. They felt there's just too many medications, difficulty swallowing, there were administration times outside of the home, at school, or at a daycare, or at, uh, when they wanted to be at a friend's house, there was resistance by the patient and there was food interaction. Looking at adults with a um, pill count using the MEM system, the medication monitoring system, and interviews, when they started the study, there was a 13% increase in adherence. Just talking to everybody got everyone excited and motivated. But adherence fell after three months when the watching, the, the enthusiasm or the thrill of wa being watched worn off. And only one third of patients were adherent um, for at least 95% of the time. Now here's another poll. How do you think healthcare providers do? How adherent are physicians when they were randomized to a long-term double-blinded study for a protective effects of a single daily dose of an aspirin and beta-carotene. 
So 29% uh, of us said uh, 44, 38% said 55, 29% uh, said 66, and 5% said 77. Okay, well, in this physician study of 33,000 33, participants in an 18-week placebo run-in period, adherence was... Uh, adherence was defined as taking two-thirds of their doses. So only 66% were adherent with taking two-thirds of their doses. Now I don't have a study of nurses or pharmacists or other health care providers, but I wonder if we'd be the same. So in conclusion, adherence to chronic medication is difficult for all age groups. So we really need to have an accurate estimate of adherence so we can be alerted when there's a sudden negative change. And adherence is difficult to measure, so maybe if we link strategies together, we, it might work the best. So in this study, they linked four different strategies, direct um, face-to-face interviews, audio computer assisted self-administered interviews, laboratory analysis, and medication records. And they found that they had a 69% adherence. And um, in addition to the other components of good adherence, they found two others, that is the adolescents were less likely to um, abuse alcohol and if they remained in school. So they took this group of 69% and they only followed them and they looked at their non-adherence in 12 months. And they found that only 50% were adherent. And failure was associated with comorbidities such as depression. So we need to increase the percent of teenagers who remain adherent with their chronic medications because this non-adherence can have a lifelong impact on them. So what are some of the strategies that we have to augment adherence? Well, some of the tools we have, we can use calendars, we have alarms I can, uh, we can hand out, we have dose sets to put their weekly medications, we have sticker charts, which but are, tend to be more for the younger child, we have youth support groups, where teens get together with their peers with the same diagnosis, and we have youth family support groups. So, watch out. Here comes a healthcare professional loaded with an armamentarium of adverse tools, um, adherence tools that we can use. Well, not quite. This is an, um, a study done in Ontario where they surveyed physicians, nurses, and pharmacists who looked after HIV patients. There was a 56% response rate, which is an excellent response, and they found that there was a gap, a gap between what we should be providing and what we know we should be providing and what we actually provide. So this uh, support gap ranged from 31 to 75%. So how do we motivate healthcare workers to uh, reduce this gap? Well, this is one way. This is a public relations activity that you could possibly do at your hospital or institution, and we tried it here at our hospital at CHEO and with great success. And so at Halloween, you can hand out a candy bag with exact numbers of a variety of treats with instructions and see if the staff can follow this for one to two days. So this is the example that we had. Take two jujubes in the morning and three jujubes in the evening. Take a jelly bean twice a day, a Smartie at bedtime, a corn puff at bedtime, a pumpkin seed at bedtime. Well, we had some healthy things put in there because we had a dietitian with us and she, she made us put in some healthy things. So take two cranberries once a day. Take a scotch mint once a day. So this is just, again, so the healthcare provider experiences what some of our, we're asking some of our patients to do. So this is an example of what not to do. This did 
get approved by an institution's uh, review board, and they called their uh, adolescents over and over again every day for four weeks. And I wonder if this was a bit intrusive, having all these calls. Something that we do uh, at CHEO is we just take ordinary uh, pharmacy ointment jars and we get the adolescents and the children to decorate them and they don't look like pill holders anymore. And they'll put them in with their toothbrush or their overnight bag when they go to uh, extended family or over to friends for sleep over. So this is just sort of an easy way to, 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 to facilitate not leaving your pills at home when you're not sleeping at home. Also, it's a, sort of another low-tech idea is a uh, calendar to remind them in the language of their choice. They can use uh, Justin Bieber or whatever sort of uh, stickers or symbols they want for their medication. No, no names so that if anyone finds this chart, there's no releasing of uh, or disclosing of diagnosis. And um, they just fill it out. But, you know, I find that most teenagers have a cell phone and they can just access uh, the alarms on their cell phone. And one of the uh, pro uh, projects that I get students to do or the patients to do is to just find an app, search the web, find a free app that works for them. Another strategy would be have better drugs. Um, and of course, you know, for ideal drugs, we're all looking for very effective drugs that are powerful, small, uh, small, small volume. And here are some strategies that we can do to uh, mask bad taste. And uh, we can mix uh, medication with chocolate milk, give it with a high fat food. And for younger patients, there's online programs of um, videos to help learn the skill of swallowing tab tablets and capsules, such as at the University of Calgary, there's a program better than a spoonful of sugar, how to swallow pills. But that's again another teleconference talk. This is an example of what we have at CHEO. We've got these for liquids, tablets, and capsules in both English and in French of instructions that um, how to take medications. And if you can contact uh, Tracy or myself, we can uh, send those off to you. So my s summary, my last poll, of what are the strategies to help an adolescent manage taking chronic medications on a regular basis? Yeah. yeah so this is just a gimme, gimme question um, to drive home my last points. And that is that we need to coach adolescents so they decide to be adherent. We need to coach them so they're ready. We need to schedule their medications around their priorities. And we need to work with them to set up their medication taking, setting them up for success. We need to explain these medications and why they're taking them. And then we need to explain them again and explain them again another day, another month. And so I just want to end with this, um, this, this suggestion of, or support of patience and wisdom as a coach. We need to be patient of know when to wait. We need the wisdom to know when to go for it and also the wisdom when to back off. So that is my presentation today. Thank you very much for the opportunity. This is a topic that's very dear to me and I really want to learn how to help our adolescents and I'm ready to answer any of your questions. Lisa, maybe we can just pass over to you to remind people how to ask their questions. Yes, certainly. Um, if, uh, if you have any questions or comments, please write them into, type them into the question uh, box in your control panel, probably on the right-hand side of your screen. I don't have any uh, any comments yet, but just a reminder that this is uh, uh, recorded, and uh, we will be posting it on the Knowledge Exchange Network, and I'll show you where that is. And one of the um, 
one of the um, tools that making medication taste better, that's also up on our Knowledge Exchange Network, so you can easily access that uh, from here um, if you go to uh, the Knowledge Exchange Network. So um, I encourage everybody to, uh, it will be uh, posted here, the, um, uh, the recording, and uh, again, you can look for all of our past recordings here. So uh, at the m moment, I have no question. Oh, here we go. Something's coming in. Okay. Well, maybe while that question's coming in, I'll toss out a question for Natalie to start things off. Sure. Um, one of my questions is more around um, how to get this messaging out to providers, Natalie. I mean, you certainly have, have touched on sort of what we need to do. I guess it's how do we um, how do we get our how do we transform the thinking of our our peers, and I'll, I'll venture to say even almost more the old school thought about, you know, I'm just giving you the medication so you, you, you need to take it. How do we get them to shift their thinkings um, in various organizations, regardless of professional type? Well, I really like this kind of forum where it's a whole um, group of different healthcare providers that we're sharing our experiences, and it's just not a group of pharmacists or a group of nurses or physicians or all the different, you know, even the um, uh, physiotherapists or the group adherence to their advice. So I think it's, if we get together as a group and realize we're, we're with the same issue, I think it really is the way to go in the future and to get the message out. For sure. Thanks. Lisa, did you have another question? Yeah, we have a few uh, a few questions and comments coming in. So from Siri, um, we have a doctor who has given up on our 15-year-old patient, uh, CF and CF-related diabetes, who is non-compliant. No family social support, continued attempts on our end, what to do. We've tried counseling, involved child life being direct, giving sticker charts, journals, apps, consequences, etc. We're at a loss. Well, one of uh, the physicians, or one of the pharmacists I used to work with, uh, who worked with cystic fibrosis, used to say to the cystic fibrosis patients that, you know, if you don't take your enzymes, you're not really social because your fart stinks so much and the other adolescents don't want to be around you. And I just thought, you know, uh, there's, there's different ways to come at it and, and to sort of what's important to the adolescent. But I, I don't think you can ever give up. And I think that's where patience, patience, patience comes. Because this, this you know, CS clinic, it used to stop at, at when I was at hospital for sick children. And, and that's not happening anymore. They're being transitioned to adult care centers. They're, 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 they, you know, they're carrying on. And so we just, just, just keep patience. And, and when that adolescent is ready, be there. And if there's what anything you can do, what what will they take? Maybe maybe that uh, shopping bag we give our cystic fibrosis patients is too much. So what will they take? I have another question from Leslie. Uh, would you recommend contracting as a method to engage adolescent transplant patients? If it will work, you know, and I would need a psychologist to come and talk about um, contracting and I certainly do that in my personal life and in fact we had a, 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 challenged, uh, a, a challenged patient come to our clinic and he, uh, adolescent and he couldn't learn the names of his medications and if he could learn one name at a time I would give I would slip him a chocolate bar so yes I have um, I have stooped to that level um, but he eventually learned his name, his names of his his drugs. So there you go. And how do you address post transplant medication related weight gain with adolescents? We need better drugs, and it's the same with my HIV drugs that affect the um, you know giving um, our patients very thin arms and a uh, um, and a big stomach. You know we're trying to get away from those medications that cause those um, lipodystrophies. Um, you know, we just have to look at strategies of eating, uh, eating healthy. And one of, the, one of the very active members of our clinic is a dietitian. 
and working with our adolescents, especially with chronic illness, how to make sure that they have um, healthy medications, healthy choices with their, um, with their eating. Uh, I guess jumping on that, has, uh, have you had any success, Natalie? I know you mentioned the buddies as another option. Um, maybe having uh, youth support groups that um, where kids can sort of learn from each other. We've had uh, great success, and, and uh, um, I would have our social worker or our psychologist come and talk about our youth group, having them share with each other and meet each other, and meet each other so that they can go and leave the group. And, and sometimes they would text each other, time for our medication, let's take it. And even when they went off to university, and we're in different cities, they would continue to text each other and to take their medication. So I really like the idea of getting their buddies to help us. And it's not us pushing them, it is their own support, their peers that are helping them take their medication. Well, I don't have any other questions at this moment, but I just wanted to, to touch upon uh, something that you had said, Natalie, uh, about uh, doing a, a presentation on transitions from pediatric to adult care. Uh, CAFC right now has a community of practice in transitions from pediatric to adult care, and we're after the CAFC conference in Toronto, we're having a, a, a half-day workshop. And uh, I have sent out information about that to people, but um, I'll send it out again to our patient safety collaborative, and and I would encourage people to become involved in that as well. And uh, and Natalie, uh, if you're going to be coming to Toronto, it might be an interesting uh, workshop for you as well. So I wasn't paid to do that plug on transition, just to make that clear. <laughs> I'm paid at all for that. There you go. So there you go. <laughs> All right. Well, you know what? I think it's actually a good chance to wrap up. Uh, um, I, on behalf of my co-chair, Darlene Bolivar from the IWK, IWK um, I would like to thank everybody that's uh, joined in on the teleconference today. I think, uh, judging by the questions, it certainly is something that we're all struggling with. And so I do believe that there's opportunity for even more conversations of this nature. As Natalie said, certainly um, being able to talk about it um, across the country is a good way of even starting to uh, change perception and awareness amongst providers within the various organizations. So uh, for sure, if there are other people that want to connect, um, but I will certainly be at the, the, um, uh, at the symposium, and so if you want to do a touch base there or either by email or through Lisa and the CAFC office, we could certainly do some more connecting and uh, and uh, conversations about where we could possibly even take this particular issue. Uh, and certainly on behalf of the uh, CAFC Patient Safety Collaborative, I'd like to um, thank uh, Dr. Natalie Deneco today for sharing her insights and uh, providing with, uh, us with a lot of uh, uh, go away and, uh, and mull kind of information where we can uh, think about how we can uh, make uh, things a little bit easier and more interactive with our, our teens to help them uh, be successful and safe in their medication administration. So on that note, uh, last word to you, Lisa. Well, just um, thank everybody again for, for uh, being on the call with us and uh, encourage everybody to come to uh, the CAFC conference in Toronto and, uh, and uh, the Patient Safety Symposium, and we will be having our next Patient Safety Collaborative webinar at the end of November. So uh, hopefully we will uh, be in touch before then and we'll all uh, get together in Toronto. So take care and have a great weekend.